Good evening, Calvary Baptist Church. We're back online. It's Wednesday night, and I want to invite you to take your Bible and open with me to Matthew chapter 8 as we continue our series, Walking Through the Gospel According to Matthew. And so as we begin tonight, I want to remind you of the uh, kind of the pattern of Matthew chapter 8, right, or really of the entire book of Matthew as Matthew begins starting out making sure to emphasize uh, the truth that Jesus is the king. He is the son of David. He is the king of kings. And all throughout the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew makes sure to continually point us to this theme. And it is, it is beautiful to keep your eye on as you're walking through, as you're reading through the gospel according to Matthew. This will be helpful to you. But uh, in Matthew chapter 8, we see Matthew kind of articulating this in the narrative um, in the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 8, one, verse 1 through 17. Matthew is, is showing us that Jesus is king and has all authority over sickness, over our corruption. In Matthew 8, verses 8, 18 to 22, um, Matthew is expressing to us that Jesus is the king and has authority over men. He has the right and the authority to command us to follow him. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, that's our text tonight, and Matthew showing us that Jesus is the king and he has the authority over all nature. And then um, next Wednesday, as we're in Matthew 8, 28 to 34, Matthew will emphasize that Jesus is the king. He has the authority over, in, over even demons. And so tonight, as I said, our text is Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. And so I want to invite you to read along with me as I uh, read, and then we'll pray, and we will begin. I love you guys, and I miss you. Let's, let's begin. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came unto him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your love. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather online, um, to, to gather around your word. And we still, God, we pray for safety. We pray for grace. We pray for our state leaders. We pray for our uh, leaders of our, of our nation. God, I pray that you would just continue to give safety and healing and grace there is still so much happening. Um, Father, I just pray that you would give us patience and grace. I pray that you would give wisdom to our leaders. God, I pray um, that you would um, lead us as a congregation. We look forward to the day that we're coming back together. And Lord, I pray that you'd give me and I pray that you give other leaders of our church wisdom as we contemplate um, uh, opening the doors of Calvary Baptist Church. And we pray, God, that you would, we pray that you would bless. And Father, even right now, as we, as we gather around your word, I pray that you'd help us to, to, to put away so many distractions that might pull us away from this time. And I pray that you'd help us to focus right here in Matthew chapter eight. God, I pray that you give me grace and the grace to the hearers of your word. God, I pray that you'd help us to focus in, to see you rightly. Holy Spirit, we pray for your wisdom, your guidance. We pray that you would do it. Only you can do, transforming us from the inside out. God, thank you for this opportunity, this time. We love you. It's in Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Church, we left off last week where Jesus was commanding his disciples to follow him. Look with me just further up in the text in Matthew chapter 8 in verse number 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. 
And that's where we concluded last week's sermon. We will always want to make sure that we emphasize this, right? When we, as we work through the gospel according to Matthew, as we go sermon by sermon, there is a temptation for us to accidentally cut up the gospel according to Matthew into bite-sized pieces and to not consider the context. What I want to remind us here is that Matthew 8, right, the, the context here, what we left off in verse number 22 is that Jesus is saying, follow me. And look where, look what happens in verse 23, because there is a connection here, right? There's a literary connection that's helpful to us. So verse 23, and when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. Now, this this is a very subtle connection, but it is a real connection. I, I want us to, to see it here, right? The king calls us to follow him into storms for his glory. Notice the connection. It's subtle, but it's real. In verse 22, Jesus says, follow me. In verse 23, his disciples do follow him. Um, Charles Spurgeon wrote this, they were wise to follow him and safe in doing so, but they were not therefore secure from trial. You see, this is important. Our king calls us to follow him, but in following him, we are very safe, but in our safety, we are not necessarily secure from the trial. Jesus calls us to follow him and he leads these disciples immediately in, in the context of the narrative. He leads them immediately into the storm. This is going to be helpful for us. So first of all tonight, notice God's providence on display. Jesus could have provided a very safe journey from one side to the other. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So they get into the ship. They're on the Sea of Galilee. They're traveling from one side to the next, right? So here it is that Jesus, he leads them into a ship. This is providence. He could have provided them a safe trip, but the storm was for his own glory and for their good. He brings them, he leads them into the ship knowing the storm is coming. Listen, this is providence. This is purposeful. This is a plan. This is not accident. This is not happenstance. This is providence. Jesus is leading them in the middle of a storm. There is a reason. There is a purpose. The storm is not there by simple chance. The storm is there for a specific purpose. And the purpose for this storm in these disciples' lives was for the glory of God and for their good. Now, this is, this is relevant because the same, the same truth still applies to us today as believers. As we're following Christ, oh, we are safe, Christian but it does not mean that we are necessarily secure from the trial. The trial isn't the problem. The trial is there for the glory of God and for our good. So let's talk about this for a moment. How is this storm going to be providentially used for the glory of Christ? Well, it is in this storm that the disciples are going to begin to learn. They're going to begin to see Jesus for who Jesus truly is. So uh, Jesus kind of shows himself to the disciples in a way that shouldn't be surprising, but it is, um, it is for their good. They are seeing Christ in a new way. It's for the glory of Christ that they're going to recognize that Jesus is not like us. Jesus is different. We might even say Jesus is holy. He is other than. And that's really going to be where they conclude. At the, end of, at the end of this text, they're going to conclude that Jesus is other than. He is of a different class. He is not like us. He is different. He is holy is an excellent word to describe what they are, what they are at least feeling, if not 
articulating perfectly well. So Jesus is not like us, and it is for the glory of Christ that, that they are able to see him rightly because of the providence of this storm. They're going to see Christ in a, in a new light, in a better light. They're going to see him more clearly through the, the, the trial or through the temptation, through this storm. They're going to see Jesus more clearly. Now, so it's for the glory of Christ and it's for their good. Why? It is through this trial that their faith is deepened, their faith is strengthened, their faith is confirmed. It is for their good that they recognize who Christ really is. So remember, the providence of God is on display as Jesus leads the disciples onto the boat and the storm doesn't simply happen and then Jesus responds to the storm, but rather Jesus sets this entire scene up. Think with me to, to John chapter 11 when Mary and Martha, they ask Jesus to come and, and to, to save Lazarus. What does Jesus do? He waits before he gets there. For what purpose? To providentially put everybody in the circumstance that Jesus needs them in in order to, to reveal his glory for their good. God works all things together for good to them that love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Christian, the trial, the heart, the heartache, the problem, the, 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 the thing that we fear that comes upon us is for the glory of God and for our good. So let's, we already used Lazarus as the example. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 34. I, I, I hope that this can, this can bless you. Let's start in verse number three. We're going to kind of not read the entire Psalm simply for time, but in verse number three, David writes, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, is saying, magnify the Lord with me. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. So he's telling us why he wants us to magnify the Lord with him. He says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So David writes, he says, I want you to ex exalt him. I want you to praise his name with me. I want to do this together as a congregation. Come along with me, praise him with me because I have prayed and he has heard me. God has done something that only God can do and I want you to praise him with me. Taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself. Pray to him and he will hear and answer you. Oh, fear the Lord, all his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, you children, and hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of of the Lord. So David has prayed and has and has been answered. God has answered his prayers and now David is saying I will teach them because I know that the Lord is good and I will teach them to do what I have done in seeking God in my trouble and in my trial and in the temptation. I have prayed and, the, and God has heard and delivered me out of my, my, uh, my, my difficulty and I'm going to teach others to do the same. And so look, the providence of God is on display. David wants to teach us that God is 
trustworthy. He is faithful and he is good. And so what we see is God's providence on display in Matthew chapter 8 that, that this trial is for the glory of God and our good. David, he prays, and as a result of what God does for David, he's able to teach others also. He, he recognizes that the difficulty was for the glory of God and for his good, and he will turn around and he will take the good that he has learned from the, from the trial, and he will minister to others because the, the heart the heartache, the difficulty, the trouble, the storms of life are for the glory of God, ministering to us for our good. And then we, as believers, turn to our neighbor and we minister to them and we, we show them the glory of God through our lives and how that even the, the trial was for our good. And then our neighbor receives good at our hand because we, we show them and we declare to them and we ask them to do what David did and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So remember this, that the providence of God when we're talking about providence, what are we talking about? What we, what we are saying is that all things work together for good to them that love God. That there is nothing that is outside of God's control. And God, in his providence, has brought you to this place. Not, not for your harm, but for your good. He has brought you to this place sometimes as as it is our nature, God uses difficult things to help us to see him rightly. And that is not for your hurt. It's not for your harm. It's for your good. It's for your healing. So notice the providence of God on display. And secondly, I want you to see with me Jesus' two natures on display. Now, the theological term that we use to describe the two natures of Christ is the hypostatic union. So in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. These words are not wasted. That the, the reason that Matthew includes this phrase, he was asleep, is not simply to give you a small detail, but rather to help you to recognize that Jesus was truly man. But by the end of our text, what Matthew also wants us to realize is that not only is Jesus truly man, but he is truly God. And so we describe this mystery that in the one person of Jesus Christ is two distinct natures that are inseparably joined together. That Jesus is truly God and truly man. What we're not saying is that Jesus is 50% God and 50% man. That kind of idea kind of pops up in Greek mythology when you have kind of like a, a demigod. You know, where you've got this, this half man, half God type figure. That's not Jesus. That's not the teaching of scripture. Jesus is truly God and truly man. The hypostatic union, two distinct natures inseparably joined together in the one person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus truly um, needs sleep because his human nature needs sleep. His human nature feels tired. His human nature feels hungry. His human nature feels thirst. His human nature feels pain. His human nature is just like our human nature. That's why our high priest is touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he is not God simply pretending to be a man, but rather he is truly God and 
truly man. Jesus, this is the, this is the mystery of the incarnation. This is the hypostatic union. What we recognize here is the humanity of Christ. And it's important that we, that we articulate, it's important that we believe and recognize that Christ is, in all points, tempted like as we are. He feels what we feel. Why? He is human. God does not feel tired. God does not feel hungry. God does not feel thirsty. God does not feel in the way you and I feel. And the reason is there is nothing lacking in God. But Jesus, as touching his human nature, he needs sleep. He needs food. He needs uh, water. He needs. God needs nothing. But God has condescended to enter in to our misery and he has taken upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And so God has condescended in such a way to, to veil his glory, to wrap himself in flesh and now he feels what we feel. He needs the same kind of things that we need in his human nature. But uh, in Jesus's divine nature, he feels no hunger. He feels no thirst. He feels, he does not feel tired. But our God has, has condescended to be with us so that he can bring us to be with him. And here we see the, the divine nature and the human nature of Christ in this single story, and it is beautiful to behold. Again, um, this is contrasting against what we might understand as Greek thought. Sometimes in Greek mythology, in that kind of idea, it's almost as if in Greek mythology, the gods um, are somehow envious of of the humans because we we are mortal and so we feel things and we we experience so much in a in a way that is different than the Greek gods and so the Greek gods are envious and they want to to kind of be a little bit like us listen to me Christian there is nothing so far from the truth our God lacks nothing. He is eternally blessed. God does not look down upon his creation and feel jealous or envious. God did not condescend to enter into human, human history so that he could experience something. He condescended and entered into human history so that he could save us and bring us unto himself, not because he lacks anything, he is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything. He is eternally blessed. God is self-sufficient, self-existent. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they, God is before all of creation. He needs nothing. There, the great mystery is, why does God create anything at all? Because he needs nothing. Nonetheless, he has created and he has chosen to love and he has chosen to condescend for the reasons that, that are mysterious to me. It, other than it is of his choosing, it's of his nature. He, he loves us, not because there's something lovely in us, but because he is love. There's something about him that he chooses to set his affection upon us and he has come for us and he has loved us, not because we loved him, not because we were lovely, not because he, not because he owes us something, but rather out of the goodness uh, of who he is. And so we see God condescending and entering into our misery so that he would pull us out of the miry clay, set our feet upon the rock, and that we would enjoy, that we would enjoy him, that we would live in the light of his glorious grace so that he, he is going to save us from this misery. And Jesus is 
asleep in the boat. And really, it's important that we recognize that what we're talking about is Jesus's human nature, the hypostatic union in one person, two distinct natures, but these two distinct natures are inseparably joined together. So we've seen God's providence on display, Jesus's two natures on display, and we also see the disciples' faith and fear on display. So in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, and when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? And so the disciples' faith and fear on display. Matthew Henry says, Jesus does not chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but he chides them for disturbing themselves with their fears. Notice here, Jesus, he, he it seems to me that he gently rebukes them it seems he does rebuke them, but not, not harshly, rather in a way that is meant to, to draw them to greater faith. Jesus, there's no indication here that Jesus is angry with them, but rather he's calling them to, uh, out of fear, calling them to believe. So they come to him and they are clearly terrified. They are scared. They think they're going to die. The disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We perish. They are afraid for their lives. So let's ask this question. Is fear sinful? Depending on who you ask, you, you may get very different answers. Is fear sinful? Is Jesus upset with them because they feel fear? I really believe the honest answer is no. Fear in and of itself is not sinful. Why do humans feel fear? Isn't the feeling of fear even something that is created by God? Why is it that you have the ability to feel fear. God is created, there is, this is in our nature. We have this, this ability to feel fear. Is fear sinful? Well, no. But fear can become sinful. For example, when fear comes to the place where it, it overwhelms us and we become terrified, where we are fearful to the point where we're, we, we are out of control, that, that the only thing that we can focus on is the fear. That's when it becomes sinful. Now, how can we remedy fear or how ought we remedy fear? Now, fear is not in and of itself sinful. Sometimes fear is good and healthy. For example, you want to make sure that your children have a healthy fear of the stove. You teach your kids, don't touch the stove. Why? The stove is hot. And you threaten your children not to touch the stove. Why? You want them to have a healthy fear. You want your children to have a healthy fear of you as parents, of uh, not just as parents, but have a healthy fear of all authority. Why? Your children, my children, need to have a healthy fear of authority so that they would obey. Um, uh, as, so to keep them safe from something greater than the authority or something that is more terrible than the authority. When, when you teach your children to have a healthy fear of you, it's because if your child is running toward, um, running into a busy street, you want them to have the kind of healthy fear of you that if you were to call them and to order them to stop, that they would stop before they run out into the street in peril of their life. But if your children have no healthy fear of you and they're running into a street and you command them to stop but they have no healthy fear of you and they walk in and they run into the street and they're hit by a car, that's a tragedy. And so a healthy fear is good. There is an unhealthy fear. There is an unhealthy fear. If, if, 
if somebody is fearful of us because, um, because they're afraid that we're going to abuse them, we're going to, to, um, uh, to, to beat them, right? We're going to, to just simply hurt them because we want to establish our dominance. That is unhealthy fear, right? That's not what God is trying to instill in us. But does God want to instill into us a healthy fear? Absolutely yes. The answer is yes. But we'll get to that in a moment. But right now, is fear sinful? Fear is not sinful in and of itself. Can it become sinful? Yes. Fear can become sinful and often does when we allow fear, when we focus on the thing that we're fearful of. And, and that fear overwhelms us to the point that we can't, we can't think through logically um, uh, you know, the next step. We're, we're so overwhelmed with fear. What ought be our response as Christians? How should we and can we overcome fear? And I think the answer is going to not be surprising to anybody, but the answer is prayer. Consider this. Prayer is the remedy for fear, not because prayer is magic. The reason prayer is the remedy for fear is not because everything we pray for is immediately given to us by God. Sometimes we think that, well, you know, I, I prayed and prayed and prayed, but God didn't give me the thing that I wanted. And so I'm still, I'm still living in this, in this panic fear. No, Christian, prayer is not so that I would receive everything I want when I receive it. No, the reason prayer is the remedy is not because it is magic and I always get delivered out of everything that I pray for, but rather the reason that prayer is the remedy for fear, not because prayer is magic, but because prayer is honest. When you read through the Psalms, you'll notice how honest David prays. How honest so many of Old Testament saints pray. When they pour their heart out to God. Think of Job. When Job is walking a fine line between being honest and pouring his heart out to God and to outright um, blaming God and trying to bring a charge against God. But, but nonetheless, Job is very honest in his prayers. David is honest in his prayers. Where David pours out his heart to God and says, God, why are you not delivering me? God, why are you not doing the thing that you said you were going to do? If they kill me, how will I praise you? God, deliver me, save me. And these prayers are honest. And honest prayers are a remedy for fear. Honest, recognizing that I cannot, I cannot deliver myself from this trial. These disciples, they can't deliver themselves from the storm. But they, they seemingly have enough faith to eventually, in their desperation, wake up Jesus and say, Jesus, we're going to die. It seems that they have enough, fi- enough faith to recognize. And Jesus says they have a little faith. They have enough faith to recognize that they need to come to Jesus I wonder if, with their backgrounds, Peter, James, John, of of being commercial fishermen, maybe they thought they might be able to overcome the storm in their own strength. I don't know if that's what happened, but it's possible. And simply, they have... They have nonetheless come to a place where they recognize they cannot overcome this storm. And in their desperation, they come to Jesus. They are, they see, are seemingly overwhelmed with fear here. And they say, they say Jesus, um, Lord, save us. We perish. We're going to die. They're fearful. And so what's the remedy? To come to the only one that can deliver. And to rest in the fact that he is good and he knows what is best. That prayer is the remedy for fear, not because I always get what I ask. Prayer is the remedy for fear because I'm resting in the one who, who is sovereign, who is king, who is Lord, who is providentially controlling all things for his glory and for my good. 
And even if in the moment I cannot see how or why this is good, I can rest in the fact that God is in control and I will be honest and pouring my heart out to God and say, God, I don't understand why. God, please deliver me. God, save me. But nevertheless, as Jesus prayed in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. No matter what happens, God, I will trust you. That is the remedy for fear. Prayer, not because it's magic, but because it's honest. Jesus, look at this, will not refuse them. He has led them to this place. He has brought them here. And while they have only a little faith, he will not refuse them. Christian, no matter how much faith, as it were, you, you possess, Jesus doesn't answer your prayers on the basis of um, the tenacity of your faith, the, the quality or the quantity of your faith. He doesn't answer your prayers on that basis. He answers your prayers on the basis of who he is, not who you are. He doesn't answer my prayers because of Aaron. He answers my prayers because of who he is. And so as I'm resting in him, as I'm coming to the one that is in control and I'm putting my trust and my rest in him, I'm recognizing that he won't refuse me. He will answer and, and, and his answer is good and I will trust and I will rest in him because Jesus does not refuse his own. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul makes the argument that if God has given to us even his own son, wouldn't he also freely give us all things? If the Father would send the Son to the cross for us, wouldn't he therefore give you all things? And the, the obvious answer is yes, absolutely so. So Christian, go to him in prayer Go to him and know that he will never refuse you. Now, that does not mean that every time I'm in a storm that Jesus is, Jesus is going to um, miraculously calm the waves for me in the moment. There are many sick people that may be delivered from their sickness and other sick people that will not be delivered from their sickness. No matter what God chooses to do, God is in control. As you read through Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter that we often call the, the hall of faith, there are some followers of God, some children of God, that the king, for them, delivers them out of their trouble. And then there are other children of the king that God did not deliver them out of their trouble. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, it speaks of, for example, and some of them were sawn asunder, which seems to be a reference to Isaiah the prophet, that, that from what we understand that Isaiah was, was killed by being put into a log and sawn in two. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, it says some were sawn asunder. It seems to be referencing the great prophet Isaiah, God could have saved Isaiah from the saw like God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. He decided to save those three Hebrew boys from the fire and decided not to save Isaiah from the saw. Nevertheless, God loved both. Christian, we're resting in God, not in what God can do for us. And so... We must, we must recognize who he is. So we've seen God's providence on display. We've seen Jesus' two natures on display. We've seen the disciples' faith and their fear on display. And fourthly, the divine authority of Jesus on display. Look with me in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 26. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Jesus' authority on display. He rebuked the wind. Now, 
the text doesn't say, doesn't give us the language that Jesus rebuked the disciples, but he does rebuke the wind. So um, Jesus rebukes the wind, right? And, and then <laughs> after he rebukes the wind, um, the winds and the sea, there was a great calm. There was an immediate response from the elements that Jesus commands nature and nature obeys. Consider this, this incredible scene. What did Jesus just do? He commanded the wind. I wanted to, to remind you, look with me in John chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And Je Jesus is, is preaching the gospel to Nicodemus as it were. He's, dis he's telling Nicodemus that um, uh, he's telling him that unless you uh, are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's telling them you must be born again. He, you know, born of the, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Look with me in John chapter three and verse number eight. Listen to Jesus' words here as he's describing the miracle of the new birth, the miracle of regeneration. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus speaking to Nicodemus about salvation. He's saying the Spirit of God regenerates a person. The Spirit of God gives life to, to the lost, right? The Spirit of God brings regeneration. But notice, I, I just want to point something out to you. How does Jesus, as Jesus is describing, um, regeneration is something that is not in control of, of Nicodemus, that Nicodemus has no ability to cause himself to be born again. Nicodemus cannot save himself. Jesus says you must be born again, and being born again is a work of the Spirit of God, and he says the wind bloweth where it listeth, so is, and so here's the analogy, and the wind does whatever the wind wants to do in, in this way or like this in the analogy, the Spirit of God um, does whatever the Spirit of God does. I cannot control the wind. Why? Because I'm not God. I am a man. I am mortal. I do not have control over the wind. I don't have control over the Spirit of God. Now, in this analogy, I want us to see something because I think it's helpful to us as we're working through Matthew chapter 8. Because as Jesus commands the wind and the say to, to, to cease and everything goes calm, right? What did Jesus just do? He commanded the wind. That is something that is only, only um, something that God can do. Only God can control the wind. That, in fact, is the point of Jesus illustrating the movement of the Spirit of God with the wind in John chapter 3, verse number 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth. The wind does what the wind wants to do unless you are God, and then the wind does whatever you want it to. Then the wind blows exactly where you tell it to blow. If you are divine, the wind stops whenever you tell it to stop. It starts when you tell it to start. It blows as hard as you tell it to blow. And so when Jesus commands the wind to stop, this, this created thing, the wind, when the creator commands, the creation obeys. Because Jesus is not only man. He is truly man. He's asleep in the boat. But he is truly God. And he commands the wind and the sea, and the wind and the sea obey him. So now, finally, look at something worth fearing on display. 
something actually worth fearing. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch as the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came unto him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew Henry, um, Matthew Henry points out that the only thing little in this entire scene is the disciples' faith. You see the great tempest and the great calm, and you see the little faith. The very next verse but the men marveled. So when, when there's a great calm, the men, the disciples, marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What we are seeing is something worth fearing. Now, Jesus unveils his glory in a sense in this moment. He shows himself who he really is because he commands the created thing that no man can, can command. Nobody has the power to command the wind and the sea to calm. But Jesus does. Because Jesus is not a mere man. Jesus is not simply one of us. He is one of us, but he is, he is, he is truly man and truly God. Jesus unveils his omnipotence, his he is all powerful here. Now, um, this Greek word here, when it says the men marveled, the, the Greek word that, that in English is translated marveled for us. This Greek word, as I read, um, it's used in the Greek Septuagint. If you're unfamiliar with what the Greek Septuagint is, the New Testament authors, as they are writing um, our New Testament books for us, right? As they're, being in, as they're being carried along with the Spirit, as, as Peter tells us. As these New Testament books are being inspired by the Spirit of God and, and these holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost, right? As, as Matthew writes Matthew, as Mark writes Mark, and so on and so forth. As these New Testament authors are writing these books for us, they are often quoting from Old Testament sources. And, and sometimes, as you're reading through the New Testament, you will, you will come across a New Testament quotation. And when you look that New Testament quotation up in your Old Testament— Sometimes the New Testament doesn't quote um, the, the quotation of, of a particular Old Testament passage in your New, te New Testament um, passage doesn't exactly match. Sometimes it it's, can, can seem a bit strange. But rather, the biggest reason is because our New Testament written in Greek, the Old Testament that our New Testament authors would have been using and referring to is the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And so our English Bibles, our Old Testament is translated directly from Hebrew. But the New Testament authors, they are often quoting from a translation of the Hebrew Bible that is in Greek. Now, the reason this is interesting, for example, is um, when the Greek Septuagint translates um, the word that the word for Yahweh, it translates that word as "curios." So, when, for example, in Philippians chapter two. When it says that at the, at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is, that is a New Testament passage quoting Isaiah in the Old Testament. If you go back to the reference in Isaiah, when it says that every knee will bow and every tongue cut shall confess um, uh, Yahweh, Jesus is being called in Philippians chapter 2, Yahweh, and all of these Greek readers would have understood that because as they read the Old Testament text that 
Paul was referencing in Philippians 2, they're reading the Greek Septuagint. The reason this matters for us in our text is this word marvel, this is interesting, this, world, this word marvel, this Greek word, it is um, often used in the Greek Septuagint sometimes to express to be frozen in fear, to be horrified, or to be staring in fear. So, this is what I want us to recognize. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 27, after Jesus calms the wind and the sea, and there's a great calm, but the men marveled. And the men were frozen in fear. The men stared. See, I imagine with their, with their jaws to the floor, and they feel fear. Why would they feel fear in the presence of Jesus? What's the beginning of wisdom, church? The fear of the Lord. And sometimes we want to say, well, that's not really fear. What it really means is, is being awestruck. Yes, being awestruck is a healthy fear. It's not a terrified fear. It's not a sinful fear. It's a healthy fear. It is healthy to fear God. He is all powerful. If you were in the presence of a lion, would you feel fear? I hope you would. It would be healthy for you to feel fear in the presence of a lion. Why? Because that lion is far more powerful than you are. If you would feel fear in the presence of a lion, how much more fear ought you feel in the presence of a man that speaks to the elements and the wind and the sea obey? Therefore, the men marveled. There is something worth fearing. For example, in Luke chapter 12, let's, let's look there just for a moment. Listen to what Jesus says. Some, sometimes we get the false idea like we shouldn't fear anything. Look what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. Now, if we go back to Luke chapter 11, verse 53, right, just to give us more context. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for them and seeing to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So the Pharisees are trying to find something that they could charge Jesus with, accuse him, because they want to ruin Jesus. They want to destroy Jesus. They hate Jesus. Just so we're getting the context, right? And so in chapter 12, verse number one, in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people in so much that they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So Jesus begins to speak and he says, I want you to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. I want you to beware of them. I want you to beware of becoming like them. And he's speaking to his disciples. Let's skip down to verse number four. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. So what are the Pharisees wanting to do? Destroy Jesus. Likely destroy all of his followers. Destroy, destroy the 12. And Jesus is telling his disciples, don't fear these Pharisees. Next verse, verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him. Now Jesus is telling us to fear someone. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Church, who has power to cast into hell? Jesus saying to fear God. Who does Jesus say has the power to cast into hell at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter seven. Remember, Jesus is the, is, Jesus is the final judge. And many will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord. And he, and he will say to some of them, depart from me. I never knew you. Jesus is telling us to fear 
Jesus. It is right to have a healthy fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When the Apostle Paul writes Romans chapter 3, as he's, as he's coming to the culmination of human depravity, um, one of the final marks of human depravity is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. How is it that Christians, we, we imagine Jesus to simply be our best friend, that everything about him is he's only always looking out for our good, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter, no matter anything, Jesus is kind of like our big buddy. Listen to me, Christian. Jesus ought to be feared, not, not, not to be terrified of him, but to be awestruck in amazement with a healthy fear of the Lord so that we, would, that we would learn to obey him, that we would learn that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He doesn't want you to fear him in a, in, in a way like, like an, a, an, a victim of abuse. He wants you to fear him as a child who loves their parents and has a healthy fear for their own good. Fear him, obey him, love him, respond to him rightly. Jesus is worth fearing. Their question is this, what manner of man is this? They are afraid for good reason. Jesus just commanded the wind and the waves. So the disciples now, right now as a result of Jesus providentially leading them into this storm. They have now seen Jesus in a way that they have already seen Jesus's divinity, right? In, earlier in the chapter, Jesus is healing lepers. Jesus is, is, is healing um, healing people. He's healing all manners of sickness. Has Jesus already revealed himself to be divine? Yes, he has. But in this moment, he has revealed himself to be divine. And, and if they didn't recognize who Jesus really was before, and seemingly they, they didn't fully grasp, they are getting a clearer picture of who Jesus is. And without the storm, without being providentially led into the tempest, they would not have seen this, this glorious sight of who Jesus is. Because the, the, the reason for the tempestuous sea, the reason for this trial is for the confirming, for the strengthening, for the, for the, for the good of these disciples as they learn why they should have deep roots of faith and trust in Christ. They're beginning to realize who Jesus really is. They needed the storm to help them to recognize who Jesus truly was. Jesus led them into the storm for this purpose, for this reason. It was not an accident. Look at this. As in verse 22, Jesus says, follow me. And they followed him into the storm so that they might begin to recognize who Jesus is. At the end of verse 27, or rather in verse, uh, yes, in verse number 27, they, they're asking the question, what manner of man is this? We're going to get to this next week, but in verse number 29, the devils know who this is. And they're terrified of Jesus. Now, the devils ought to be terrified of Jesus in a way that his children do not need to be terrified. The devils ought to be terrified of Jesus because they will be cast into hell. Christian, you, if you have put faith in Christ as your Savior, if, there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The fear I and you ought to have for Jesus is healthy and good and right. And the reason trials, the, the reasons the storm comes into my life is for the glory of God, that I would see him rightly and 
for my good because in seeing him rightly, my faith is firmed, it's strengthened, it's deeply rooted. And in that, others and myself recognize who God is. This is for the glory of God and for the good of the disciples. The disciples realized who Jesus was. And the method that Jesus used to help them to see was not simply by telling them, I have the power to command the winds and the sea. Jesus, right, what does David, what does David tell us? He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It was in this moment that they tasted and they saw. And sometimes to experience the trial is unsettling. But when you look back upon the sea that you are being tossed to and fro in, that you are being, that you are, you are, scared of of what might happen around the corner christian you you are not sinful because you feel fear but go to him in prayer and 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 learn to rest in that prayer to him as you pour your heart out to him and the feelings of fear may not may not go away simply because you pray but rather you are going to you are going to express your faith in him even in the midst of the fear that you feel and and in this tempestuous sea God has led you to this place because it's in this heartache it's in this trouble it's in this circumstance that Jesus is showing you a little bit clearer who he is because we see Jesus often clearer in the storm than we do in the blue skies so don't shrink back don't fail in your faith don't run away from God in the middle of your heartache run to him in the middle of your heartache taste and see that the Lord is good the disciples are beginning to realize who Jesus really is. They needed the storm to help them to see him. Christian, we are beginning to see who God is in the middle of our storm. Don't jump ship now. Go to him, pray to him, seek him, love him, trust him. Be honest in your prayers if, your fe if fear is overcoming in you. Pour that heart out to him. He's not going to rebuke you for your feeling of fear. No, he is going to show you who he really is. And it's going to be for his glory. It's going to be for your good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would just continue to bless your people. I pray that you would strengthen our faith. God, as I, as I consider the 12 I honestly believe that their faith was, was better than my faith. Whether it is or whether it isn't, here's the reality, God, that I need, I need my faith strengthened. I need my faith stretched. I need my faith deepened. And I'm thankful, God, for everything that you have, you have taught me. And I pray that you would give grace and strength to all of your people that you would just continue to show yourself even in the midst of the trials of our lives. And I pray, God, that you would, uh, that you would, you would bring us through the fire as pure gold, as, as Peter talks about. We love you. We just pray for your grace in our lives. It's in Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Church, I love you. God bless you.